and um, welcome to the May 2023 Cascade Mycological Society meeting on the CMS YouTube channel. And uh, tonight we're uh, thrilled to have Lauren Ray uh, come talk to us on lichens. Uh, Matt Lauren at um, Pacific Northwest Key Council meeting about a year ago, and uh, we've had her partner Jack Johnson speak, and we've had her housemate uh, Buck McAdoo and now finally we've gotten around to having Lauren Ray speak. Uh, Lauren's uh, a resident of Bellingham, Washington, and has serves as an expert mushroom identifier and educator for the Northwest Mushroomers Association. And she's graduated with a BS from Evergreen State and studied ecology and cryptogamic organisms, such as fungi, lichens, and bryophytes. Uh, for several years, she played an active role in the South Sound Mycological club and she became the program chair and chief mycologist there while developing an approachable introductory curriculum for those interested in mycology. Nice going. Uh, she's passionate about community science, waxy caps, the, the hygrophoraceae, and bringing greater awareness and understanding of fungal diversity. Thanks for being our guest speaker tonight. And Lauren, we'll take it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so proud to be presenting to you all tonight. And this is my first full length lichen presentation and I have taught hundreds of folks about lichens, but I'm so excited to have a chance to just focus entirely on lichens because there's always mushrooms and plants involved when I'm out on walks. So I hope you guys like it. It's a lot of information and quite a bit of technical terms, but I'm gonna do my best to make them as minimally scary as possible and all the bright colorful photos will hopefully uh, ease any concerns you may have. <laughs> All right, so spectacular symbiosis, an introduction to lichens. Okay, now I've got to get this to go. There we go. So lichens, what are they? So they're non-vascular composite organisms creating a symbiosis between three kingdoms of life, fungi, green algae, and or cyanobacteria, which have been traditionally called blue-green algae. And it's not always um, all three together. There can be a dominant um, algal partner and that can be the cyanobacteria or the green algae, um, but they can also grow all together. And so here's three pictures kind of showing you examples of these three kinds of um, symbioses. Up first is the cyanolichen. And you can kind of see usually that there's a little bit more of like a blue greenish color, kind of like seaweedy. Um, sometimes more gray, more brown, but it's usually more dull colored. And color isn't always a way that you're going to be able to distinguish between these groups, um, but you'll start to pick up on a trend. Once you learn which lichens have which uh, partner, you'll be able to kind of notice it a little bit more. And so this bright lichen on the right here, this is the uh, brown-eyed sunshine, Volpicida canadensis, and it is a green algal lichen. It also produces uh, brightly colored secondary metabolites um, as a kind of sunscreen pigment. So it's not only kind of greenish, but almost neon. And then on the bottom here is a peltidra that has both a green algal partner kind of as the base. And then there are these tiny little pimples that will go over and those house the cyanobacteria. We call those tripartite lichens. Okay, so uh, what is it made up of kind of cellularly and uh, physically? There is the algae, which we call the photobiont, and they are able to photosynthesize and produce sugars, which then feed the fungus because fungi are like us, they cannot produce their own food and have to seek it elsewhere. And so that <laughs> led to this evolution of these tightly intertwined kind of cohabitations between these organisms. And the fungus partner we call the mycobiont. So the fungus in return is able to kind of customize the housing of the algal partner. And so there's such a diversity in the appearance of lichens. And this is because basically the fungus is building the entire structure so that that uh, photosynthetic partner can best reach sunlight and photosynthesize even in kind of shady forests and more dark lit areas. Okay, and then here's just kind of a graphic showing you that. Um, that ascocarp, will go over that a little bit more. And that's just showing a sexual fruiting body of this fungus in which just fungal spores are being released. And then we kind of see this spaghetti fungal hyphae just weaving up a nice bed for the algae to kind of sit near the surface and produce sugars. 
we'll go over Ceridia on another slide. Here's just another kind of visual for you to see uh, the layers of the lichen. There are uh, a upper cortex, and that's just kind of like this, this crust that's mostly fungal um, with the symbiont layer kind of right underneath that. And this that spaghetti layer again called the medulla, which is just kind of a spongy hypha layer. And then not always, but sometimes there is a lower cortex as well. Okay, so just to begin, kind of a moss versus a lichen. Uh, a lot of times they are cohabitating, very much intertwined on a log, on a rock, and they can look similar sometimes. In this case, they look pretty different, but people are often confused about which one is which, especially if you've never had any formal education on uh, either of these groups of organisms. And so they are quite different. Mosses are in the plant family. Um, they are also non-vascular. So both these organisms do not have roots that kind of tap into soil like trees and shrubs do. Uh, they are able to get their water from the air. And I will show you something about that as well later. But um, just to kind of give you a visual spread to help you kind of pick up on the trends between mosses and lichens, because both groups really are super diverse and there's you know hundreds and thousands of species and so and like i said they're usually tightly um kind of competing for space so on the left i guess yeah it's the left here uh you can see the mosses and there's usually uh this kind of droopy feature this is the sporophyte and these were, are where these tiny spores will be produced after uh there has been sexual reproduction um, and this is a structure that is pretty common. You'll see them, not every moss will have them, but they'll kind of be poking up high above these cushions. And um, there's a general trend, they can look quite different, but that's, if you see that little structure there, sometimes there's this beautiful comb-like structure, like the one on the top, it's called the peristome where it opens up. Um, then you'll know you have a moss and they tend to be a lot leafier. You can see kind of the bottom photo showing more of a close up of these fine, fine little leaves and while there's a lot of overlap in color and habitat, usually if you see fine little leafies, then you might have moss, but it takes some getting used to. So on the right, we have some lichens, and this is once again just a broad spread showing you how variable they can appear. Uh, but generally, they, well, there's not really a general, but I guess I just wanted to show you this to kind of prime your eyes to see if you, I'm sure you've been out, if you're a mushroomer, you've seen these types of growth forms before. So if you're able to kind of um, group them together in a way, it's, on, it's honestly easier to recognize a moss. And then if you're saying, hmm, this is a little different, it might be a lichen. So uh, I'll show you more photos of some of these groups and that might help you kind of pick apart what's what. Okay, this is a fun term. It's <laughs> poi kilo hydric. And this is the lack of ability to pull in or maintain and regulate water content um, to achieve homeostasis of cells and tissue. So there's constant flux of the moisture of a lichen, as well as in bryophytes, because they're not able to um, pull water up uh, as they lack roots, they are entirely relying on atmospheric water to help their uh, metabolism function. And you can see this very quickly, um, the term desiccated referring to kind of a dried up um, state where there's really minimal or no water remaining in the organism and the lichens will curl up and kind of just sit tight. And then as soon as there is some form of moisture, be it rain or fog or mist or splash, um, they kind of reanimate and are able to unfoil and kind of resume um, their functions. And so it's something you can do very quickly if you bring home um, a dry organism and put water on it, you can usually see them kind of re revive and reanimate. The more fresh it is, the more uh, quickly it'll be. And this happens while they're still, you know, in situ in the, in the field. Just if it becomes dry, they're able to kind of hang in there until there's more water. Okay, what do lichens look like? Like I said, it's quite diverse. Here are some of the morpho groups. Um, morphology refers to just the, the forms of something. And so this grouping is kind of showing um, different groups of, of forms that we see uh, trends in with lichens. And it's not a hard line. Sometimes there's overlap between the two where um, part of the lichen kind of fits more into one category and part of it fits into another. Um, but it is helpful to kind of notice 
uh, how they kind of fit together in these groups. And also just to disclaim, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're related to one another. It just kind of, it's like with mushrooms and gills, it's a convergent evolution where uh, whatever they uh, ended up having most success with in terms of growth and reproduction is what worked out usually for more than one group and lineage of life. So first we have fruticose here, and it's kind of just like a 3D outspread branching. Um, there's quite a lot of lichens that will, will do this, and they're usually, if they're on the bark of a tree, they'll kind of be projecting outwards, like I said, in kind of a three-dimensional uh, format. It's a helpful way to think of it, um, because most of these other groups are generally more kind of flat or two-dimensional in some sense. And so below folios, uh, it can be hard to tell folios from fruticose, but think of foliage, it's leafy, so it tends to be uh, the form that kind of represents leafiness or lobes. And you have crustose next to that, which are usually pretty flat, uh, just kind of like a crustose fungus. They are things that are, well, the term crust for, for mushrooms can mean a variety of things depending. But in my mind, I always imagined crusts as being something flat. This can be on rock or on wood. And then above that, we have squamulose, which are these tiny little flecks that are a way that certain lichens will asexually reproduce. Um, and so that grouping that that one belongs to Cladonia can also kind of be fruticose, where we have these outward little, um, the lipstick lichens that will kind of make a long skinny structure that comes out from these squamules. And here's a simplified uh, illustration kind of showing that and find it a little bit more helpful than <laughs> Uh, the, you know, many photos at once. So yeah, crustose kind of more flat, folios being kind of uh, intermediary, it can be a little bit more 3D, but generally leafy, and fruticose being, um, you know, more upright. And then what was the other one? Squamulose kind of gets grouped in as uh, crustose sometimes. So, you know, don't worry too much about which one's which for now. Okay, how do lichens reproduce? So the dominant form of reproduction for lichens is typically asexual reproduction. And that is because this is the best way, most optimal way to ensure another organism will kind of be created from this process. Because by doing this, they're able to give off these propagules or these little bits that have all the partners already packaged up nice and ready to go. And as long as they have the right environmental conditions, they can maybe take take hold and turn into a new lichen. In that case, it's going to be a clone. So the fungus, it's gonna be, you know, genetically identical from the lichen that it came from. Um, but it, and which, you know, there's cons there in terms of um, kind of resistance to disturbance, resistance to pathogens. You have a, a lesser diversity when you are producing clonally, but because the symbiosis has so many partners, all of which have their own ways of kind of coming together, it is generally more advantageous for lichens to reproduce this way. And so there are a variety of ways they can do this. Uh, we'll start with the first photo. This is Pycnidia. And this is the only photo here that is showcasing the only the asexual reproduction of the fungus. So these are gonna be clonal spores um, and those are gonna have to still go off and find another um, fungal partner, or I guess in this case, maybe just the um, photobiont, but it's not a ready to go system. They still need to match up. Whereas these bottom ones, these nice green uh, features here, we'll start with the squamules. Uh, all three of these are going to be uh, containing the fungus and the algae. And so on squamules, they're just these tiny little flecks that kind of can get washed off or brushed up against by an animal and kind of just create a little tear that will then kind of maybe take root and grow. On ceridia, uh, they're actually, this one's always confusing because they're ceridia and ceralia. And so ceralia are these groupings of ceridia. I think I got that one straight. I'm not a lichen expert. I just really love lichens. Um, and so these are just fine powdery granules that are, they're super fine, really more than any of these other uh, structures. Isidia come close, but uh, it's kind of a nice ready to go uh, system that, like I said, anything can brush up against it. Insects can kind of carry them on their shells. Uh, mammals will get them in their feet. 
and then uh, land somewhere where they're maybe going to grow. Isidia, same situation. It's just kind of a slightly different structure. They're more elongated. It's kind of hard to see here, but rather than more of a roundish granule of sand or so, they're a little bit, they're more described as like hot dog cells where they're just like, or packages that are more elongated and they are, they can be distributed in a more um, kind of widespread way than Ceridia sometimes, depending on the lichen, but very similar, just kind of a different, slightly different shape and, and layout. Okay, sexual reproduction. So here's just a diagram showing you a lichen that is um, going to produce sexually. So this is just referring to the fungus. The algae, algae does not uh, produce sexually. Uh, they are just, you know, out there kind of producing in mass numbers. And this fungus is going to have this kind of half moon shape that is a cross section of this uh, kind of, it's a cup fungus. So a lot like the cup fungi you find out there growing on their own. Uh, they're in a similar lineage and same phylum, ascomycota, a lot of lichens, majority of lichens are in ascomycota and they will make this cup-like structure to produce fungal spores. So that's a cross section there. If you go in closer, we have these microscopic structures that you'll also see on a, a regular oscomycete, a non-lichenized uh, species, where we have these packed spores in these acai, these long elongated cells holding the spores. Those become released and then have to not only land in a place that has sufficient moisture and kind of food to germinate, but then find a mating type that is complementary to their own. Oh, I should make sure that my computer is not going to die. Let me just quickly plug this in. Sorry, that was kind of anticlimactic there. They not only have to find a mating partner to for the, just the fungal species, but then they have to kind of cruise around and find their specific species of algae that uh, are involved in their symbiosis. And there are uh, many species of algae that have dozens of different fungal partners, but each fungus has a very specific algae that it needs to find. So this kind of limits the opportunities and the chances of all of this working out are pretty slim. So less than 1% um, than of lichens produce, um, wait a second, <laughs> scratch that percentage. <laughs> I'll get back to that one in a second. Um, but anyway, so most, most majority of the reproduction happens in, um, asexually because of how difficult this process may be. Sorry, it's, it's pretty hot up here and I'm, I'm fighting, uh, my immunity's on, on high fighting COVID in my house right now. So I'm a little brain foggy. Okay, so sexual reproduction. Here's um, some actual examples of what we just saw in that diagram. Uh, they're all different types of apothecia, which are producing fungal spores for the ascomycete fungus. And they can be lots of different shapes and sizes and colors. They typically resemble that classic disc cup shape. And so that's kind of fun for me when I was getting into lichens. I've always really liked just the ascomycete cup fungi. And so it was kind of cool to see them in, like as a part of this other, you know, more ornate, more complex organism. Not necessarily more complex, but comp compositive organisms. Uh, but kind of visually pleasing, I find the cups to be. So these are all examples of that. I have this, this other term down here, it's called Lorelle. And those are apothecia. They're just kind of elongated and um, more kind of wiggly. The, the most common lichen that has Lorelle is Graphis, graphis or Graphidaceae. People learn Graphis scripta, which um, this may or may not be, they, they tend to be over id as that species, but uh, they, kind of look like hieroglyphs. And so it's cool to look at it, see if you can decode, you know, some of your own messages, but they're, they're definitely different than other apothecia and kind of have, if you look closer, they'll have these kind of longitudinal slits in them. And not only uh, noticing if, if the lichen that you're seeing has apothecia or not, but also kind of noticing if the perimeter of the apothecium has um, the same coloring as the center, the kind of the fertile surface or the hymenium, or if it's differently colored um, or the same color as the thallus. So I don't know if I really highlighted the term thallus. Let me just go back for a second. Oh, I guess, whoops, this term is important. So we're talking about fruiting bodies right now. 
But the, the vegetative part of the lichen, where I showed you there's the, the photobiont, the, the medulla hyphal spaghetti, um, that is all the thallus. So that's the vegetative part, that's the body of the lichen. And then uh, when we're talking about all those asexual or sexual propagules, um, we don't, that, that kind of represents a separate little part of something that emerges from the thallus. So just if that helps to kind of show how this is laid out here. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me, folks. So sexual reproduction for basidiomycete fungus. So here's the percentage I was wanting to give you. So less than 1% of lichens are partnered with a basidiomycete fungus. So 99% or so are ascomycetes. Um, they don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will ever produce an apothecium um, and, and reproduce sexually. Some can just do what they need to do asexually their whole lives. But the majority of them have this fungal lineage. Very, very few actually have this partnership with the basidiomycetes, which are much more of the mushrooms that people tend to know because they're including the gild mushrooms, polypores, tooth mushrooms, crusts, et cetera. And so when people see these mushrooms, it's kind of hard to fathom that it can actually be part of not just a fungus on its own, but actually this um, fungus that has partnered with algae. And so we're lucky enough to have uh, at least these two, if not um, potentially one or two more cryptic species of Basidio lichens in our region. And you've probably seen lichen on Philea umbellifera. It's out now, it kind of fruits, has a, excuse me, a wide fruiting period. And they make these kind of creamy tannish fruits with these beautiful decurrent gills. They're not super big. They're really only ever up to maybe a couple inches, but more like centimeters most of the time. And they have this really beautiful scalloped margin as well on the cap. And something to notice, if you see a mushroom that looks like this and you're wondering if it's like an Ophelia, uh, take a look at where it's coming out from the wood. So first of all, it would be growing on some type of wood that might be hard to tell if it's emerging out of the moss. But you can see in the upper photo here, there are these little green balls. And so that is the thallus. That is the vegetative part of this lichen that has the green algae in this case and the fungus. And so it's really cool to see how the more clear visual representation of what's going on here. Like I said, sometimes it can be crowded out. But if you're able to find these little balls, you can say, okay, this is probably the lichen agaric. And even if you find those kind of bigger balls, you can, without the mushroom, you can actually tell that it is this lichen because there really isn't a lot of um, there really isn't anything that looks exactly like this. There can just be algae or maybe dust, green dust lichens kind of spread on bark, but this darker green with these lighter uh, little round spherical compact balls of, of fungus and algae, it's something that's kind of unique. So keep your eyes out for that. And then we have multiclavulate mucida. So this is just a little white kind of fingery fruits. They're in the Claveriaceae. So that includes lots of our, our club, clubs and coral mushrooms. And these, it's kind of debatable if this is a true lichen or not. Uh, it's kind of considered like an almost lichen or a pseudo lichen because the, where the fungal hyphae and the algae are existing isn't as tightly bound as in other lichens. So it's kind of more of a looser symbiosis. Uh, but it is really cool to, to find them, and they're included in a lot of lichen field guides. And so these are some of our basidios that sit the city of lichens that you can find in this area. I'm really partial to the hydrophoresi, as included in my bio. And so I added the slide kind of showing some South American. Also, some, some of these can also occur in the Caribbean or Central America as well. Um, not the lichen of Alto Alto Andina. Um, but I'll start with that one. So this is an Andean um, species of lichen Amphilia that was only described in 2017. And it actually grows on the salt crusts in these high desert mountains. Um, and so it's super fascinating because it's a very, very intense environment to grow in. A lot of desert crusts are actually made up of lichens, fungi, and bacteria, and cyanobacteria. It can look super barren and just cracked, but if you actually look closely, um, these cryptogamic crusts are really actually kind of binding this uh, habitat's floor together. And so this is a species that is kind of holding one of those roles and actually is able to produce these small little agaric 
mushrooms, even in this more arid and harsh climate. So that's a dream mushroom on my list to see, dream lichen. And uh, yeah, so all of these are in the Hygrophraceae, even these kind of blue turkey tail looking things. These are all lichens. They are so fascinating. They're all in the Hygrophraceae, like I said, which I, I just, I'm repeating it, but it's mind blowing because they really don't resemble anything else in the family. And it was originally, I believe starting off as Dictyonema and split, I think that was the first one. It's been split. There's now three genera of similar looking um, cyanobacterial lichens that instead of making a gilled mushroom in this case, if you look in the center, you can see these siphonoid basidiocarps, just meaning they're kind of more of like a disc or cup like fruiting body. And that's where just the fungal spores are being made. And then this blue structure is the thallus. And so this mushroom, so I was saying that less than 1% are basidial lichens and less than 10% are cyano lichens. There's a high tendency to partner with green algae instead of the blue green algae. Um, and so this one kind of ticks both of those marks as being a really, really uncommon um, pairing and rare pairing that um, occurs in nature. And not only that, but they also produce really sought after and um, scientifically interesting uh, hallucinogenic compounds, including psilocybin and DMT, which is mind blowing by 10 times. So these are really incredible organisms. They've been used in um, shamanistic traditions and um, yeah, have a long history there. Okay. So just a couple more terms to show you. Uh, these are cephalodia. So these are small gall-like structures that house nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria in tripartite lichens. So uh, in these lichens, the main photobiont is the green algae, but because they also benefit from having a cyanobacterial partner that will fix nitrogen for them, help them get the nutrients they need, they'll produce these structures that can look different in different groups. Like I said, they're called cephalodia. And on peltig peltigeral lichens, they'll kind of look like black little pimple flecks, uh, whether or not they're easy to flick off or if they're kind of more embedded into the, into the thallus is, um, can be an ID feature for peltigera if you're finding, because there's a couple of species that look super similar. And, and this is um, Lacopsis on the right. And this kind of reddish central, really beautiful, Vein structure in the middle are the cephalodia, and then you can see the tiny little cute apothecia outer, like little donuts on the outer ring where the fungal spores are being produced. Okay, some other structures. Like I said, don't worry about memorizing these. These are kind of just maybe showing you them so that if you've looked at a lichen 10 times and wondering what are all these parts, hopefully this can help you kind of elucidate some of that. So on the right are rising. So just like the peltigera with the black cephalodia I just showed you, if you flip un underneath that lobe, you'll see these root-like structures. So that term rising, risa is referring to root and they're not true roots, but because they resemble roots, they have this term and they kind of act like a Velcro and just help them uh, attach to whatever they're growing on. And so this is a big ID feature for the peltigeras, uh, noticing the color, noticing how branched they are, and noticing if they have any tomentum, any hairs or fuzz along them. These are all things that can help narrow you down to species. And peltigeras are super common. People are always wondering what they are, thinking that they're plants or mosses um, because they're so leafy. And they can grow in pretty big swaths and they're just large lichens in general. So um, yeah, Podicia on the uh, top here. These are part of the Cladonia lichens, those lipstick lichens that are also pretty common. If you were to kind of tear one, you would see that they're entirely hollow on the inside, as opposed to pseudopodicia, which are on pyloforus, these devil's matchstick um, with the dark black apothecia at the tips. They have kind of like a spotty, um, not entirely hollow uh, inside. So that's just kind of a way to tell between these two genera, even though those are pretty closely related. Identification. So how do you identify lichens? Well, it involves more, depending on how narrowed down you wanna get, it can be pretty involved, which may, may deter some people. 
Um, but you don't, you know, you don't always have to get to species, especially if you're a beginner. I really recommend just trying to get to family or genus, trying to figure out what group you're looking at is super helpful because there is quite a bit of diversity in the region they live in. Um, but chemical tests are a way that will definitely help you, especially if you're planning on keying anything with a dichotomous key. Um, or even looking in a field guide, it will be, it, if it's a good field guide, it'll include this uh, component. And so that uh, KOH is one that's great because a lot of mushrooms already have it because we use it for um, IDing mushrooms as well. And if you, you know, if you get a color change or not and what color you get will tell you, will help you narrow down what you've got here. And in this case, the Stanthoria, which I'll also show you more of, is turning this bright reddish. And um, there's a couple of other ones we use bleach as well. And then there's um, one or two others that kind of you have to go out of your way to get. But even having KOH to start with is really helpful. So what do we have next? UV, oops, there's two L's in there, <laughs> fluorescence. So uh, it's having a UV light is great, not only for lichens, but for mushrooms, for um, plants, other organisms. It's super fun to have one. And I recommend getting one if you don't, regardless of what organisms you want to look at, going on some night walks or just kind of looking, shining this light onto organisms you bring home in lower light will help you figure out what you have. And lichens um, produce all kinds of secondary metabolites, uh, many of which will shine um, bright colors under a UV light. And so it's, you know, it's a great tool to have in your toolbox for identifying lichens. And it is also often mentioned in keys and field guides. So microscopic features, you know, there's the asexual spores, there's the sexual spores. Most of the time we're looking at the sexual spores if there is a sexual structure on that lichen. And they can be super diverse in their morphology. They can be long, long noodles. They can be little seed looking things. They can be super septate. So if you've ever heard that term, wonder what it means. It's just kind of having these kind of sections of a spore, little chambers that kind of block them off. And um, you can see that on some of the spores in the middle, number eight and nine are good examples. Wow, 13 looks cool. I wonder what that's from. It's kind of asymmetrical. Uh, this is a really helpful little illustration kind of showcasing some um, lichen spores. And also the, the number two shows this thick wall. Um, I've looked at some lichens under the microscope that have this thick wall. That's something that will help you uh, figure out what you've got as well. And then just uh, macroscopic features as well as habitat. So what you're visually looking at, all those things we've covered so far, you know, what kind of morpho group it's in, uh, if it has asexual structures or sexual or both and what kind, these are all going to help you um, at least get down to family or genus a lot of the time, not always, but it's going to help you by noticing, just noticing what you're looking at and kind of scrutinizing it a little further to understand what you're seeing. And as well as habitat. So habitat's really important with lichens. There's a lot of lichens that can only grow in very specific habitats. And something I learned in my lichen class is that cyanobacterial lichens, which are, um, that's the less than 10% that make that uh, partnership, they tend to prefer liquid water as, a, as opposed to, you know, mist. Um, and, you know, they like to be kind of more in a splash zone next to a, uh, next to a waterfall. And that's a really great place to look for them. That's where this picture is taken. That, um, what is it called? The Chutes Falls, a great park in Washington kind of near Rainier. Um, and it is just full of all these cyanolichens and mosses. And it is unique because it is this big waterfall where all these lichens can get splashed. So um, not only that, but if it's growing on, you know, the substrate, what is it growing on? Is it on rock? Is it on a twig? Is it on bark? Um, you know, these are all things that will help you figure it out. If you're in a desert forest, um, what kind of, if it's a hardwood tree or a conifer tree, all of these things are great. And if you're a mushroomer, you're probably used to kind of taking mental or physical note of some of these components. Okay, so now, well, actually, before I get into this, I'm gonna take a sip of my tea. I'm talking a lot. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Okay, you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. I always get nervous, but then it's just like, you know, it's so easy to talk about these things because there's just so much to say. They're so full of uh, interesting information. So, so I'm now I'm going to show you a couple of groups of lichens that are common in the Pacific Northwest. Some slides will be family, some will be gen genus, and some will be species. So in this case, this is Cladonia, and I'm not going to specifically uh, go over each species here. I just kind of want to paint a picture of the 
kind of diversity within each group and how to notice if you've got maybe got one of them. So Cladonias can, can range a bit of uh, the reindeer lichens up at the top were formerly in the genus Cladina, but they were kind of lumped back in with Cladonia and they tend to form big, big poofy swaths um, in, in the Pacific Northwest. So you can find them in any remnant prairie habitats that you're able to access, which have definitely dwindled much, much more. Um, there were much more prairies back in the day. But if you're able to get to one, you'll usually see some of these uh, reindeer lichens. And in the boreal and arctic habitats, they're still pretty, pretty dominant and are a major food source for um, some caribou. And I'll talk more about that. And then we have these kind of the, those podicia on the bottom. You can see those kind of elongated structures. And at the tip, you'll have the, the fruiting body for the fungus, the apothecium. And most of the time it's red if it's present at all in Cladonia, but there are some brown apothecia on Cladonia. So I included supercata there. And um, it's kind of a faint brown and they're smaller and less showy than on these other species like Bellatiflora. But I just wanted to showcase because I didn't know at first when I see so many red ones and I saw one with brown, it confused me. And they also tend to have a lot of squamules. So those little leafy flecks that will kind of um, pop off and start a new lichen. You can see that at the bottom of the photo that's more zoomed out. And then all the way on the right, the picture that's close in, you can see those even all along the, the Podicia itself, there are squamules. And whether or not that's the case will kind of help you narrow it down. If it's just towards the bottom where it's growing out of the substrate or, or on the substrate and whether or not it's on the uh, Podicia. Lobaria. Lobaria are beautiful. They tend to be pretty big and leafy. Uh, these are ones that people are surprised to learn are lichens. Uh, the most common one I'd say is probably Auraria pulmonaria, but Oregana is also pretty common as well. And uh, Pulmonaria doesn't really fruit very much. I think it can fruit, but most of the time it's it's not. Oregana is usually fruiting heavy with Apothecia, kind of a more um, branched. The, the lobes along the edge are a bit more branched. It's kind of got a wider thallus and a paler color. And then we have so these are not all the lower areas. There's a couple more as well. Oregon has a lookalike. I always forget the name of it, but we have to kind of look into that one and see that thalia. Someone can maybe let me know if, if they know. Um, my partner Jack's always like, don't forget about this one. It's not always Oregon, but people tend to ID. If you see that lighter green one, it's apothecia. It usually tends to be ID as Oregon. And then we have Scrabiculata, which is pretty uncommon, but it's, I just had to include it. I was looking through my photos and I saw it and it is a beautiful bluish grayish species. And this one, this one tends to have these like little speckled uh, serratia um, uh, along the surface of the leafy parts. Then we have Anthraspis and Anomala. These also have Apothecia. Um, what's Idita is Anthraspis usually tends to have more and have less of these kind of powdery spots and uh, anomal, anomal tends to be more brown than green, but there's a possibility that these are maybe going to be lumped together. And so uh, it might just be more of a morphological difference than an actual speciation situation. And I included a photo in the middle that shows the underside. And this is kind of, they all have a little bit different of a view from the underside, but this is kind of the general look. You, it's pretty, pretty pale, there'll kind of be some hairs between these kind of bigger uh, depressed lobe spots, but uh, lichen undersides are not always included or paid as much attention to as mushroom undersides. And everyone's like, get a picture of the gills or the pores. And it always kind of bugged me because it's something that is different. Sometimes it's included if there's a feature that is definitely distinguishing between two species or two groups. But if it's not, then it's, you know, a lot of times it's left out or at least there's not many photos. And so I'm a visual learner. I like to see what that looks like. So I try to include it there, at least for Lavaria. So here's a family, Primulaceae. Oh, whoops, this got mixed up. <laughs> actually, this is supposed to say, this is then Peltigeraceae. Actually, this is supposed to say Peltidra. So Peltidra, all of these lichens are in Peltidra. Excuse the, I think I had it copied over from the last, the next slide, but. Um, the pelt lichens are all generally pretty leafy. The size of the leaves can vary. Uh, the two species on the bottom have much smaller little lobes and are less encountered than the species, the upper species. 
Um, but I wanted to include them because they're adorable and fun to find. And if you're in a wet waterfall area, you will maybe find Venosa, which has just got these big chocolate chip apothecia. And um, in the middle, we have some common species here. Kalina is one of the only species, if not the only one, I think that will grow up on the bark of a tree. Whereas if you're seeing them kind of on wood, it's either on like a fallen log or towards the base. And it has these distinctive um, marginal serradia. So the little powdery granules are, are along the edges of the lobes there, which is distinguishable. And then Britannica here that has these uh, the cyanobacterial um, cephalodia that you can easily fleck off. And in this case, it's really interesting because both partners are involved. Sometimes, even though the green algae is the dominant one, um, sometimes the cyanobacteria can kind of take hold and act as the dominant photobiont and, and actually form. You can see this darker lobes towards the end and then the green algae kind of taking back root and we see the smaller lobes that are kind of, uh, you know, reclaiming their, their role on the, on the edges. But it's really cool to see them in this state, which it's uncommon. This is actually the only time I've seen it, but Fred Rhodes, our lichenologist and mycologist up here is always telling us to, that it's a pretty common occurrence. Um, and this will happen in other lichens as well. And then canine, I believe this is canina, it kind of has these frosty tips and a lot of Peltidra apothecia. So that little, those little tan fingernail-like structures, those are the apothecia. And people are always kind of creeped out by the way they look, but I think they're fun. And the, uh, the color and the underside as well, the color of the underside um, and sometimes texture are important as well on specifically those little fruits. But flip over those leaves all the way at the top, these have the rhizines. And so, like I said, the color, the branchingness, the hairiness are all indicative of different species. So, like I said, that should say Peltidra, not Parmelisi. <laughs> but here's Parmelisi. This is a huge family. Um, and there's many, many of our common lichen genera and species are in this family, including Parmelia, which is Parmelia or Sulcata is the most commonly identified one. It's kind of got these might be a little hard to see in this photo, but kind of these spots on the thallus that look like they've been kind of hammered in. And they generally tend to be pretty flat and have this darker kind of finely velvety underside um, that helps them uh, latch onto twigs and such. And then Menagazia is a beautiful uh, lichen that has these kind of perforated holes along the thallus looks pretty similar to some of the other genera. So I've included these all together because they, uh, they tend to be visually similar uh, besides some of these you know, more unique features like the Menagazia's little holes there. And then Hypotrochina looks a lot like Parmelia, but it actually has these, the, the underside has these little rhizines that are actually forked. And so that is a way to distinguish that. It also has these terminal little powdery serrati at the edges there. And then Plasmodia glauca, that might be our most common lichen in the Pacific Northwest. It's called the varied rag lichen. It is very variable. That's a good common name. It can look all different types of ways in terms of maybe color, how big it is, how, um, how much the, the serrati are kind of covering the surface. And so they get misidentified sometimes for beginners because of the variation, but it is really, really abundant and you'll usually see them as litter fall kind of just on the, on the ground amongst other lichens that are common. And the top lichen, Avernia, that one's in the Parmelia The bottom, Ramelina, is in its own family, but these are also really common species. Avernia, and they look similar. They, they kind of get listed as lookalikes, so I put them together here. Avernia has a kind of double-sided coloration. So it's kind of a more pale, it's really similar, but kind of like a more pale green on the top. Flip it over, it's more like a light white kind of color. And so Ramelina is more uh, uniformly colored. So that's a way to kind of tell between the two, but there, there are times where it's pretty tricky to tell which one's which. And the Sphaeronacea has these spots of serratia that are just kind of erupting from the thallus. You can see those spots, right? Those propagules are being produced. Xanthoria parietina. This is the maritime sunburst lichen. Super, super common. There is like some concern. Um, Red Rose is, is kind of ranking it as, as invasive. It 
it does grow widely throughout North America, but has was not really documented in this area and has um, he's documented it uh, grow more and more and kind of take over a lot of habitats, especially habitats that are um, marine docks and rocks uh, towards the water. This is uh, because they like, they actually can also urban areas as well. Both uh, those habitats can be high sources of nitrogen. So kind of along the water, there'll be birds, a lot of seabirds and um, pigeons and seagulls that will uh, drop feces and create this high nitrogen environment that a lot of lichens are sensitive to and cannot tolerate. Uh, but this lichen is one that can thrive in these environments. And it also produces these bright pigments that act as a sunscreen and can help it live in a really bright exposed rock where there's no shade or, or whatnot. Um, and so not only like from nitrogen from these natural sources like birds and such, but also near factories and where there's a lot of transportation exhaust, they're able to handle uh, this contaminated air a lot more than other lichens can. So there's, they're kind of taking over, which has led to some concern. But they're really beautiful. They have this, this gorgeous color and these sunny apothecia that are super abundant and these fine little leafy flecks. It can sometimes be more crustose. I might have, I might have included this one on the left. It might be a different similar species, but just kind of getting your eyes used to uh, what these guys look like. Usnia here. People usually know Usnia if they know any lichen at all. It's the species that I have on the left shows the Usnia longissima, the old man's beard. And so that's usually one that people will recognize. And it produces these long, long pendu pendulous structures kind of hanging off of um, tree branches and bark. And it's, it's longer than any other uh, Usnia, at least that I'm aware of. And so um, it's relatively easy to identify for that reason. It also doesn't have apothecia. And so um, if you're wondering if you have an usnea, you should kind of grab onto the like general like branching and try to gently pull and see if you're able to expose the central cord. And that's just fungal hyphae. That's kind of the medulla there, but it's unique for this genus and part of the identification, um, at least to get two genus, if you wanna to get to species, you can actually cross section this and you measure the ratio of how much space the inner cord takes up as compared to the cortex, which is that thinner layer wrapping around it. And so just to get to genus, if you pull, it's usually if it's wet, the, uh, if an usnea is wet, you, any species, it'll kind of feel stretchy, like maybe a little bit of a rubber band. And that's that stretchy cord on the inside. And you'll be able to crack the cortex and actually see that cord. So here's, I forgot to credit Fred. This is Fred Rhodes's photo here. And you can see that um, really beautiful, bright cord. So it's always fun on forays to, to pull them and, and notice it. And so I definitely recommend if you see usnea longissima, do not remove it from a tree if it's still growing. The populations are dwindling and it's concerning. They tend to be um, harvested and over harvested as well as loss of habitat being an issue, but um, only do this with litter fall that you're finding uh, on the ground. And then here's an example of an usnea that is producing an apothecium and it has this beautiful radial little branching coming off around the edges there. I just love to see those kind of an uncommon treat. It's a different species. Not sure which species that one is. Hypogymnia, these are the tube lichens. And you're probably noticing by now, like so many of these lichens are this like minty color. And uh, that tends to be a cons pretty consistent color for uh, the green algal lichens. And not all of them are that color, but a lot of our common ones around here are. And you can just, there's quite a range of, of morphologies in these, but basically uh, these are kind of, they're called tube lichens because they're these inflated actual, like the branches are inflated tubes, where if you just pinch some of it off, you can actually look inside and see this hollow space on the inside. The color that it is on the inside is one of the ID features if it's black or kind of uniformly pale colored, and they'll usually be pretty uh, heavily apothecate. So you'll see on the bottom, those cups, that these, they range from kind of a brown to more of a greenish color, depending on if they've been partially degraded. But you'll see tons of apothecia and hy hypogymnia. This big picture only has a couple starting to form, but it's, uh, it's very, very prominent on these. And that tube, tubeness is definitely um, helpful for getting to figure out if you have a hypogymnia. 
Uh, one more thing is that they actually, this one that I've included, uh, the larger photo has pycnidia as well, which are asexual fungal spores um, being produced from these little fine black speckles along the thallus. Okay, so where do lichens grow? They grow in so many different places and on so many different things, but really commonly we see them growing on tree bark. And a lot of people kind of have their mind Mine's blown when we uh, tell them that all in this rubra are red alder, super common hardwood tree in wetlands, especially and as a primary succession tree. That white bark that is so distinctive in them is actually lichen. You can see the color beneath this white lichen with those little black laurelli I was telling you about earlier, those kind of script looking fruiting structures. That more kind of generic brown, kind of a sooty grayish brown, is the um, actual color of the bark itself. But it, it, these lichens are so consistently growing on the bark of these alders that they usually end up covering the whole thing and making them look like they're just bright white. And if there are alders growing in a more um, or other lichens where uh, other trees that have a similar kind of brightly colored lichens and they're growing, say, in a row next to a factory, we'll notice that they will be lacking these lichens that cannot tolerate those pollutants and they'll look almost like an entirely different tree species. So that kind of tells us maybe a little bit more about the environment and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a second. So they can also be growing terrestrial like these reindeer lichens here, these cladonias, kind of growing in big tufts kind of on the surface of the ground. They can be on foliage. So our Western red cedar, it's really great if you're, if you're you know, if it's a more dry mushroom year, which we've been struggling with lately, uh, you know, if, if there's some cedar, um, even other conifer needles, uh, just kind of pull some down. You're, you, they're usually at a reachable distance, and you can usually notice um, at least one to a couple of lichens actually growing on the needles and leaves of these trees. Um, and the closer you look, the more you'll see, including tiny little apothecia um, on some of these as well. Uh, very commonly on rocks and boulders as well as kind of human modified structures that like mimic this natural, you know, rock environment and are using, utilizing some type of rock like kind of sidewalks, um, tombstones, which I'll show you a picture of, especially if it's rock that's been broken up or kind of um, scarified and scratched off because then you're creating even more surface area for these lichens to be able to kind of latch on, root themselves to. Um, and so a lot of times lichens will really happily grow in urban and suburban areas because of how much um, substrate we offer them. Fences, vinyl siding, roofing, rock, you name it. And then we have twigs and branches. So tons of twigs, branches, both on the tree while it's alive and then fall. And if the branch falls, the lichens can kind of continue to grow as long as they can still get their sunlight. Um, but we'll usually end up, you know, if they don't have those requirements anymore, they'll end up slowly senescent and dying. Oh, it's a good little feature uh, effect there. So here's just kind of more examples of lichens growing on tree bark, just a really common site. These are all in pretty populated areas and lichens can just be super abundant. So you don't have to go all the way out into, for into the forest to notice um, this diversity right in front of you. So I definitely encourage you to take a closer look when you're on a walk in your neighborhood um, or just kind of, you know, Anywhere where there's a tree or a rock, take a look and you'll have a high chance of finding a lichen. And some of them can be really, really fine and, and powdery, like this one on the right here. It's, you know, because of its bright color, we're able to see it. This, um, yeah, we're able to see it better. Kind of, they'll, they'll get themselves ingrained in the grooves of the bark. And um, if they're not brightly colored, it might be harder to notice. Like the one on the bottom here. If you actually look closer, there are these tiny little orangey apothecia. But otherwise, it just kind of looks like driftwood. But even driftwood is a great place for lichens to grow. And then here's some examples of them growing on um, tombstones, sidewalks, phone poles. They can really tolerate quite a variety of, of, of uh, environments. And because they're not actually needing soil to grow, you know, they're, they're just really needing to get uh, up in the air to get their moisture and their light. Uh, they can really uh, surprise you. So because of this feature to, you know, that is their, their entire source of getting moisture and minerals is through atmospheric uh, moisture, this will lead to them being great indicators of air quality, which has been studied and actually a lot of times 
the funding for any type of lichen research will be air, uh, air quality studies. So if we need to see if an area, you know, is um, how bad is the air? Is it in the, in the middle of a city? We can even see super heavy metals being deposited from factories and there are actually chemical tests you're able to do to see exactly which compounds, which minerals, which elements and in what concentration. And so because of their like perfect little, um, you know, nature made um, technologies for this. And so there are mechanical technologies that can be made to measure air quality, but it's much cheaper to just focus on collecting lichens. And so you'll see um, lots of papers and research and funding that is actually um, trying to uh, figure out what stage are forests in, what kind of state and quality are they in. And this includes old growth too, which I will talk more about but there's tons of lichens that are nitrophilic and can, you know, actually will only grow in areas that are, are really um, poor nutrient. And so this can, uh, if you're seeing a lot of those of xanthorias, you're probably in, a, in an area that has at least just general car exhaust and um, you'll be less likely to be like deep in a, in a beautiful old forest. Okay, roll in succession. So lichens are super critical in succession. Succession is just the, the basically the establishment of more, um, I wouldn't say advanced, but more developed forests. So, you know, in order to have an old growth forest, we have to start off from just, you know, bare rock a lot of the time. And um, this, this can be if there's been a forest and then it's been degraded and we've only got like kind of the bare minimum back, you know, big boulders and kind of shredded up organic material. Orgas can just be, you know, the very first development of forests. Um, where there was just magma and, and rock and pooled rock and bedrock. And so lichens and bryophytes are some of the only things that can grow on these bare rock. And because they produce enzymes that help them kind of slowly digest the rock, get minerals that they need for their metabolism, they're actually over long scales of time, hundreds of years, they're creating these little micro pockets of soil, which then smaller little annual plants and other lichens can start to take root. This then adds to this um, compounding of soil and, and organic you know, accessibility. You know, herbs, grasses will come in uh, and this will just continue and kind of create a greater and greater scale until we have a fully functional forest where big trees can grow, send their big, large waxy tap roots into the ground and um, you know, we call it a climax community. So this is after it's gone through all these different periods of succession. And this can repeat over and over again too, but um, regardless of the cause uh, or time frame, a lot of times we'll see lichens as these early, early organisms kind of inhabiting you know, a habitat that, that nothing else can grow in. Living in bare, bright sun, where there's just super almost nothing, you know? And so I have pictures of uh, some rock dwelling lichens on the bottom here. And they can be very beautiful. If you go out to the Eastern side of the Cascades or, you know, into other more arid areas, you'll see really vibrantly colored rock dwelling uh, species of lichens. And they're just absolutely stunning. And like I said, that bright color tends to be a sun um, UV um, protectant, kind of a sunscreen. Okay, almost done here. Ecological importance to animals. So tons of animals use lichens. People are always kind of saying, like, so what are they doing? They're just kind of like growing on the tree. Um, but lots of animals interact with them, including hummingbirds and other birds. Tons of birds will actually use lichens for their nests. Uh, the picture of the, of the hummingbird is really so special. These tiny little creatures um, almost, and lichens will make up the majority of their nesting material. Uh, slugs and mollusks and other insects, but especially snails and slugs, love to eat lichens. And you can see um, kind of this, like, if you ever see a pattern that looks like kind of little chomps in a trail, little scrapes along the outer surface of the lichen, a lot of times that's an indicator that some mollusk has made its way through and kind of eaten some of the upper cortex and, you know, digesting it and thriving off of it. So. Uh, really important for food sources, nesting material. Um, the boreal woodland caribou, they are, um, and specifically the mountain ecotype, are our most endangered large mammals uh, in North America. And um, it is a really critical situation with them. This is not the mountain ecotype, but um, all of the woodland caribou do eat lichens as a winter 
diet food in the spring and summer, they're able to eat kind of those fresh leaves on trees, but once it gets cold, they're living in these higher elevations. Uh, some of the only thing they're able to access is lichens. And so some of them, like the ones in this photo here, they will actually scrape through the snow, even if it's a feet or more of snow, they will use their hoofs and kind of burrow down until they can reach these, what, they're, what are called reindeer lichens, these cladonias, um, and that will act as one of their primary food sources throughout the winter. And now our specific woodland ecotype especially they've been almost extirpated from North America. There are still some left along the Canadian border, but um, the remainder of the population are in BC in fragmented uh, populations and are super, super, super dwindling because that ecotype, this kind of um, specific, like they're all the same species, but they have a particular uh, kind of area where they live and uh, diet that differentiates them from these other ones like this one's shown. Uh, they actually have to eat the hair lichens that grow on old growth trees and they, they form kind of like the, the usnea longissima. These are kind of more dark ones I'll show you in the next slide. They will, they will grow and form these long, long trailing um, growth off of the branches and the woodland caribou will climb on these multiple feet of snowpack to be able to reach their necks and grab it and chew it and eat it. And so that is like uh, such a, you know, specific food source. And as the temperature warms, the snowpack is less and they're able to reach less and less to grab the Briaria hair lichens off the branches. And to make things worse, these Briaria can only grow um, certain species will only grow on old growth trees. And because old growth has been so, so, so destroyed, um, and also not only destroyed, but usage, giving usage to people using um, snowmobiles and skiing, this will push out the caribou. Um, there's more introduction of predators. And so there's a lot of things that are uh, going against these caribou right now, but specifically the tie with the lichen is their food source um, and the the tree growing species making it even more difficult for them to access. So I have humans down here on the bottom too. Humans, you love to use lichens. Uh, different cultures have different uses. There's food, there's dyeing fibers, um, there's kind of even making kind of uh, more thinly formed fibers itself out of the lichens. And um, yeah, we don't really have like in our modern North American um, culture, a lot of uh, uses with lichens, but there's a lot of traditional uses and they're still used around the world. And they're, um, they're being more sought after for dyeing fibers. Uh, here you'll hear that becoming more popular as well as in um, some medicine making, which I'll also comment on. Okay, Northwest Forest Plan. So there aren't a lot of lichenology jobs. It's really hard to be able to study lichens as a living. And it's a shame because of how uh, important. I've highlighted them to be here. And so the Northwest Forest Plan, which was implemented during the Clinton administration in 1994 as a response to overharvesting of old growth, uh, actually set into legislature to have um, lichen surveying. So people who are actually going out there determining which lichens are in an area and therefore helping indicate air quality, age of a forest, of, um, diversity of species in that area. And so um, this has kind of dwindled out a bit since then, but for a while, people were able to actually work as contractors and survey lichens. And some of these jobs still exist, but most of them unfortunately um, are not existing anymore. And so that was just a big kind of boom for lichenology and kind of the legacy of that still shows in the this region being one of the most uh, full of lichenologists than almost anywhere else. Okay, here's a fun little cartoon, moss versus lichen. Um, it says, oh my, oi moss, this is my stone. It says, no, it's not. Get off. You know, who's going to make me? Just each, each compounding amount of year they're fighting and it's like, you know, she stopped reading it halfway through and says, I'm coming over. Come on then and uh, you'll be sorry when I get here. So the moss and the lichen are just, you know, they can have a rivalry for hundreds of years and they kind of just, you know, they don't really actually do anything to fight one another when they do reach one, the other one, but they do, uh, will kind of overcrowd the other one, which could eventually lead to that one dying. Okay, I think this is my last slide besides the resources. 
Uh, just a disclaimer of harvesting lichens. So there is a trend to be using lichens in herbalism as well as in like gardening um, or in kind of terrariums and decorative uses. There are really big, large scale um, harvesting of lichens, especially for the decorative use. You'll see them kind of in the craft stores. And that's not something that, I mean, I hope I don't have to advise any of you against. It's, it's super destructive. A lot of these lichen species are very sensitive. Um, but even on your own, if you're wanting to use lichens um, for any reason whatsoever, please do not remove them from what they're growing on. If it's on a branch or on the bark, on a rock, please leave them be. A lot of them, like we showed just there, take hundreds of years to be able to grow. And um, if you just come through and disturb that, you know, that can impact the, the future of the species, at least in that area. And so if you want to use lichens, you can very easily find litter fall. Uh, this means that it has, there's been a storm or wind and these branches have been knocked onto the ground and there's just lichens just kind of laying there on these twigs. And even then, please just be mindful and respectful and try not to harvest a lot because other animals are going to continue to use these lichens and they will degrade and, you know, help form new soil and um, just detritus in our forest. That's, that's important. So and be careful because some lichens uh, produce toxins. And so don't uh, make sure you investigate, look at peer reviewed research if you're hoping to consume any. Um, and just if you're hoping to use them aesthetically, please be mindful. And here's some resources. We have ways of enlightenment. Um, I'm just gonna pass, I have a document, actually I'll copy the link. Oh, I guess we can't, I can't send that, we're on YouTube. But um, I can share this, uh, the document I made and screen grab this or take a photo if you want. These are some of the field guides I recommend. Um, the micro lichens, which kind of blurry here, they are the crust lichens and are, require a more technical understanding of lichens. So I do recommend macro lichens of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then lichens of North America is a bit outdated and includes much more than just our region, but it is a beautiful, beautiful book, great photos and there are keys in there. Um, and then there is a digital companion, uh, which is the middle link to the macro lichens book. And you can kind of check off little features of the lichens you have and help get an ID. And yeah, Ways of Enlightenment is great for looking at um, like sourced, well, uh, correctly ID'd mushroom, uh, mushroom lichen photos, as well as um, writings by uh, some lichenologists. It's a really great, really great website. And then I think that's it. Thank you all for bearing here with me. I know I just threw a lot of information at you. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So there's my email, my iNaturalist, my Instagram, and feel free to reach out. I hope that you have fun learning about lichens and encountering them near you. That was marvelous. Thank you, Lauren. You're welcome. Thank you. For um, somebody who's not a uh, expert lichenologist it was pretty Im impressive <laughs> and uh, if you hadn't said that you could not have convinced me that you weren't an expert in lichens oh, uh, I appreciate that I think it's just kind of a situation where the more you know you the more you know how much you don't know <laughs> I feel that way with mushrooms too it's just there's so much out there and um, I don't I commonly misidentify lichens that are all over the place you know they, they take some diligence so I don't want to claim like I got it all down, but I do really love them. And hopefully that was accessible and uh, understandable. It, it certainly was. It was very enjoyable as well. Um, Matt, do we have any um, questions posed in the chat for us here? Yeah, we've got one. Um, is there anything that we can do to contribute to lichen research or conservation efforts? And are there any citizen science initiatives or practical actions that people can take to support lichen preservation? Wow, that's a great question. Um, just give me one moment here. I'm just copying this link so we don't forget to give this to you guys. And okay. I'm gonna paste it in the chat. I can put it out to the well, YouTube. Yeah, I'll pass it on to you guys here. Okay. Um, so I would say like the best way to get involved, at least in terms like of small scale, is using iNaturalist to make observations of lichens you find. Um, because then 
this will kind of, you know, if you don't know about iNaturalist, you can use it for any organism, not just mushrooms, not just lichens. And it is a great way to network and um, kind of communicate with other people who have expertise uh, in an organism you're hoping to learn more about. And so I have found that posting lichens, there's tons of common lichens that you might, it might take up until your hundredth lichen observation until it maybe catches the eye of a lichenologist. Um, but uh, I definitely recommend doing it because there are some that people will say, oh, I'm working on studying this lichen. Do you, are you able to get me a specimen? And then maybe you can either you've already collected it or you can go back and get it. You can, um, you know, ask them questions you may have. And if you're really determined to contribute, you can look at lichenologists in your area and your guys' region, Eugene and Corvallis has tons of lichenologists. Like that is like lichenologist hotspot. Um, and so Bruce McCune is at OSU. He's still teaching lichenology. Um, there's the, the Northwest Lichenologists. I, their icons up at the top there. I didn't mention them, but it's free to become a member. And so they will offer trainings and classes and outings and um, newsletters so that you can better educate yourself. And, you know, there'll be people who are working on different groups and they might say we need, you know, we need people looking out for this, documenting this etc. And so just kind of immer like immersing yourself in what uh, ability we have with lichenology, which isn't much, I'd say become a member of lichenologist, start posting on iNaturalist, maybe contact some of those lichenologists and ask them specifically how you can get involved with conservation because it's not something you can necessarily hop into on your own. Um, but making those observations does count towards that. And on iNat, you can also see if there are projects, you can search projects and you can see if there are lichen projects near you or maybe nationwide that you can your observations can contribute to um, I'd say also like if depending on how much you want to get into it you can read literature and and just better educate yourself on lichenology because a lot of people are not well informed and so that can also lead you to maybe even you know pursue it further uh, see if there is research that you're able to um, join a team and help collect and um, yeah, starting there, trying to protect forests. Any way you can protect forests is a way you can protect lichens. And so, and that includes mushrooms and obviously animals, plants, et cetera. But that is one of our biggest loss to diversity is, is deforestation and de degradation of habitat. And that includes prairies, not just forests too. We have, we have like less than three or 0.3% of prairie habitat left. And that is so many endemic organisms, lichens and plants that will not grow anywhere else. And so, um, I'd say just, yeah, investigate where, what, what areas uh, have been researched and see if there's ways you can kind of continue what's been done. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Matt, <laughs> other questions out there? That was the only one, otherwise just a bunch of kudos. <laughs> thank you. I was impressed with um, the your collection of photos. I know they're not all yours, but um, that one, a uh, photo where you were suggesting the structures look like hieroglyphics. I had never seen a lichen like that before. Most of the others I've seen either depictions or seen uh, organisms in the wild, but that thing was totally, un, um, totally new to me and unknown. Is that something that occurs yeah. in our region? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it occurs widely throughout the, like all of the Pacific Northwest. Um, I would say your best bet of seeing graphis or any of the graphidaceae is to um, get to, they grow on, um, some were on rocks and other stuff too, but alders, just start looking, like, like I said, the alders, if it's a healthy huh? alder patch, it'll be full of lichens. All that white that you're seeing are all these different species of lichens. So just get up nice, close and personal with the alder. And I'll, I promise you'll see one within for at least the first couple of times. I mean, almost every alder I look at has, has graphis or a similar um, graphoid lichen on it. So definitely check, but they can be small. So you got to really kind of get like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but they're beautiful and they, they're fun to kind of, you know, stare at and let yourself be imaginative, imaginative there. I will be looking at the alders the next time I get a chance, maybe even tonight. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know if you see it. I want to see how long it takes you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. It's um, You are the last in our speaker series for the 22-23 um, mushroom year. So um, 
Thank you so much for agreeing to be our capstone speaker for this series. Aww. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully you um, will recover quickly from your COVID exposure and um, all your housemates will as well. Thank you so much. I'm honored to help close off the season. And um, yeah, guys, get out there, find the lichens, put them on INAT, and just, you know, go hard. We need more lichen, lichen, <laughs> lichenologists out there. So, well, yeah. and uh, just a reminder for folks who have or have not been to the Cascade Mycological Society's Mount Pisgah Arboretum Mushroom Show, uh, the Northwest Lichenologists and members of our group as well. Uh, put on a lichen display at the mushroom show and um, it's an amazing amount of diversity and um, it's something to see on its own but uh, and because it's the macro mushroom season, macro fungi season it often gets short shrift but um, there's a heck of a lot of diversity within that group and um, thanks cool. for highlighting that tonight of course Thank you, Lauren. one last comment can i add Definitely one last question too what? Okay. A couple other questions came oh, okay. in. I just I didn't mention that lichens are named for their fungus. Um, this is like I said, this is my first time doing this full presentation, and so I'm going to take some notes on things that I can uh, fix or add. But um, yeah, so the the actual taxonomic standing of the the algae that they have is separate, and that the name that we recognize as the lichen is the fungus is. Um, name. So it's just really interesting. Um, people are like, how does that work with taxonomy and symbiosis? It doesn't work very well. It's just they decided the fungus is the more noticeable part, which makes sense. And um, I just thought of that and just thought I'd mention it just because it was kind of like a huh, moment when I learned that. Cool. Good to know. Matt? Uh, so one question is, uh, is that also called a script lichen? The one that the hieroglyphic one? Yes. Yeah. Script lichens is like the general term for sometimes for graphis, but that the family is Graphidaceae, and that includes tons of. And I, there might even be another family that includes scripts, I believe. So um, it's a very broad common name for the lichens that have Lorelle, those elongated Apothecia. Lorelle, okay. I'll be on the lookout for Lorelle, graphis. Yeah. You don't when, need they, to when they evaluate air quality, are lichens consolidating dioxins and metals, or are there other contaminants that they're evaluating? Oh my god! So I'm not a chemistry person. Uh, <laughs> definitely metals, dioxins. Not sure. Um, I'll write that down. Like I said, here's the moment where I'm like, this is where I glad I said I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, but yes, definitely metals and heavy metals, not any metal, but particularly if it's being collected and, and metal is like a, one of the uh, interest points, then it's usually in an area that there's heavy metals and, and carcinogenic um, ones for that fact. Like cadmium is one that lichens and mosses will hyperaccumulate and um, there's a study that was done in Portland specifically using mosses, but it's the same kind of general concept where um, there was stained glass, multiple stained glass factories in the same street that were emitting ex like an exponential amount. I forgot what percent, what number amount more than the legal output for, of cadmium, um, but it was atrociously um, illegal. And there are schools and preschools on this street and they were collecting, they didn't know where it, they, it was detected in like a mechanical air quality um, test and they were trying to figure out how do we know who's emitting this, who do we hold responsible for this. So they collected, these researchers in Portland collected um, this moss, the Orthotrichum laelii, which is now Pulvigera laelii. Um, and it was, it's a common, common suburban moss. And so they kept collecting it in this general area until they were able to find a stronger and stronger concentration and actually map out and physically determine which factories were um, emitting it. And I think two were held accountable and then there, the laws were upped for regulation. Um, but yeah, minerals, metals, um, basically anything that's like, um, being carried in like the atmospheric water and and smoke and pollutants, it just can, can easily be, they're like, you know, kind of a sponge, just pulling all of that in and then um, different like chromatography and other analytical tests are done to determine what's occurring specifically. I understood from um, basic research, like many decades ago, that um, at least in old growth, um, the wet forests on the west side here in the Cascades, um, 
the lichen litterfall adds a huge amount of nitrogen to the system. Definitely. Yeah, and it's that's part of why even though if I do say pizza to people saying it's okay to pick lichens, I'll say only pick litter fall, but even then limit it because you know that nitrogen's going back into the into the ecosystem along with like decaying leaf litter and um, other organic material. And it's just important that we try to minimize our impact. And it goes with mushrooms too, of course. It's like trying to keep um keep our, our impact light. So don't pick a whole patch of mushrooms, don't pick Definitely don't pick leggings off the tree. Don't take all the litter fall. Just try to, you know, keep it, keep it minimal. Keep it light on the land. Huh? Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you again, Lauren. Um, and uh, stay with us while we say goodbye to our YouTube folks. And we'll talk a minute after. Uh, thanks, okay. everybody, for tuning in to the Cascade Mycological Society YouTube channel. And uh Come back again in uh, September of this year when we start our invited speaker series again. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you there in September.